thank you so much, Ellie. You're, you're one of my favorite scientists as well. <laughs> All right, so I have to say this is a, a bit of a mad week. Um, I came from a conference in Sicily last night, and right after this talk, I have to zoom off to Germany to give another lecture tomorrow. So I'm sorry, this is, I've seen the program. It's an amazing program. I'm sorry I can't be around for a longer time. But if any questions pop up um, from um, what you're seeing in this presentation, just email me and we can take it from there. All right, so what, what do I mean by the mind of a bee? So when discussing animal minds, I guess a bare bones animal minds, mind in, in my view and in the Sort of in relation to the topic that, I, that I'm going to refer to. By the way, is it all right if I sort of walk up and down, you can all hear me, or do I have to stand right in front of the microphone? It's all good? All right. So what I'll refer to today in terms of key ingredients for an animal mind are representations of things, of space, and of things in space. I want to ask if there is a form of predictions of an outcome of one's own actions, as opposed to, let's say, an animal that's perpetually stuck in the present and just responding to incoming stimuli. And I want to see if um, there are emotional states um, attached to spatial settings, for example. So I've heard you've all partied last night, so this, is, this won't be a data-heavy talk at all. So you can sit back and enjoy it. It'll be mostly videos. Um, it won't be too hard to follow. So there is a general um, perception often that um, insects can do very complex things, but that they do so by means wholly different from how we humans achieve them. And so here's a, um, a comparison that I've lifted from one of Dan Dennett's books of two structures that are at least remotely um, similar in their um, exterior appearance, if not in, in size, a termite hill um, and the La, La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And the general understanding is that the procedure in humans is entirely uh, top-down, that there is an architect who dreams up the outcome and then passes instructions down um, to laborers who basically fill, fill, uh, basic, well, follow instructions to, to generate the outcome. Whereas the thing, so goes the thinking that in social insects, all of these structures emerge by bottom-up processes where no individual has any kind of overview or plan, but there are just interactions between lots of little hardwired robots that follow innate instructions to arrive at the ultimate outcome. And one of the things I want to achieve today is to convince you that it's at least not quite that simple, that there might be some sort of appreciation of the outcomes of the actions in social insects as well. So the debate is actually not new. People have wondered about the complexity of how uh, social insects achieve their constructions for centuries. They're obviously very impressive. And one example of um, such impressive structures is the honeybee comb, which is a, a fairly well, highly regular, mathematically nearly perfect structure and impressive in its regularity and, and symmetry and so on. It's optimal or close to optimal in terms of material, minimizing material usage while maximizing storage space. It's also double sided and while being vertical. So the efficiency of using material and space is very impressive indeed. Um, and Charles Bonnet, a Swiss naturalist, um, thought this about how it might come about. He said, place together in the same room 10,000 automatons animated with a living force, and all induced through the perfect resemblance of their outer and inner being. 
If we admit the least degree of feeling in these automatons, even only such as is necessary for them to be conscious of their own existence, seek their own conservation, avoid noxious things, prepare useful things, etc., their work will not only be regular, well-proportioned, similar, equal, but it will also have symmetry, strength, convenience to the highest point of perfection. So it's interesting that, in a sense, Charbonnet does think that the structure arises by bottom-up processes, that you just, you just stick all of these um, individuals together in the same room. He calls them automatons. But at the same time, he assumes that, they, that the consciousness of their own existence um, and the, the, the sort of um, the um, presence of feelings and the avoid, avoidance of um, noxious things and so on are, are part of the automaton. Now, it's not quite that simple as just sticking 10,000 um, individuals of any animal into the same room. Here's my connection to uh, <laughs> some chicks, so chickens in this case. Um, you, you can't just stick 10,000 animals, whatever species, into a common environment and hope that some sort of architecture emerges. In fact, in general, vertebrates are, are pretty disappointing in their architectural constructions compared to what you find in social insects. So it's not, but it's not quite that simple. Now, the first person, to my knowledge, who looked at how honeycomb is actually constructed was a guy called Francois Hubert. It's a complicated story because actually the guy was blind. He worked together with his wife and his servant. Um, and. Someone must have written his books. Someone must have done the experiments. Um, so it's not actually clear who did what in that uh, three-person um, three team. But um, he signs as the responsible author for the books. But um, so here you can see how honeycomb is typically constructed. It starts at the top in the cavity of, of a beehive or naturally hollow tree. And the, the bees gradually work their way down from the top along the direction of gravity um, until they've reached close to the bottom. They form these peculiar um, hanging chains while they're doing that. And Hubert was interested in how this um, construction works and um, therefore introduced glass screens to observe what the bees might be doing <coughs> inside their hives. And the first thing they noticed was when they introduced the glass ceiling is that the bees didn't like very much to attach their comb to a slippery surface. And what happened in that case was that the bees, instead of starting at the top and working their way down, started at the bottom and built the construction upwards, like a tower, rather than from the um, top to the bottom. And you might say, well, yeah, but it's still a robotic process. It's still the repetition of the same routines over and over. But if you had built a robot to simply mimic the natural process, starting at the top, working down along the direction of gravity, that robot would already fall on its face with this task. You'd at least have to give it the new instruction, OK, do the same repetitive construction, but invert your um, construction uh, in, in its alignment uh, with gravity. So the next thing the team did was say, all right, so now let's push the bees a little bit further. This is all 200-year-old work. It's quite remarkable, actually. So they, they said, all right, so what if we now um, it introduce a glass ceiling and a glass floor? So they won't um, have either opportunity to attach their comb to. And what the bees did in that case is that they started um, with the construction on one of the side walls and built the construction through the cavity laterally. So now they're no longer going top down or bottom up, but sideways. But the most remarkable thing for me was the following experiment. So um, after the bees had started their construction through the cavity, 
the um, team then introduced a glass screen into the path of the ongoing construction. So it's a two-dimensional sheet, basically, normally. Um, that, so it's flat, and it has a clear direction of growth. And the author in this case, authors in this case, when, um, when after this construction had started, put an obstacle onto the opposite wall from where the construction had started. What happened in that case was that before reaching the slippery surface, days before getting there, the bees turned their entire construction 90 degrees and attached it to the nearest wood wall. And so the, the important thing there is that the, the response was not to actually reaching the surface and then somehow amending the construction to make it more solid, but a form of anticipation that if we were to continue this construction and to, in the same direction until we reached that glass wall, we'd have an, a suboptimal outcome. And days before that happened, they amended the construction, took corrective action, action to um, avoid attaching their um, comb to to the um, opposite slippery side. And Hubert observed that I, he acknowledged that he could not suppress a sentiment of admiration for an action in which the brightest foresight was displayed. Now, these experiments await replication with, with um, acceptable sample sizes and so on. Um, and I'm still trying to get one of my um, former PhD students to uh, explore this further because I think it's a it's a very fascinating observation if it were to be replicated. Um, no one has, to my knowledge, in the in the last two hundred years. But it seems then that if this is robust, that there is some sort of an anticipation of what might happen if we continue with um, the, the current construction and to amend it where necessary to avoid a suboptimal outcome. Now, most of our work, ours, others, work on bee learning and memory nowadays is outside the hive, for better or for worse, perhaps because it's easier to study. But the context in which we study it is mostly flower visitation. Now, bees have to be, because of their natural lifestyle, careful shoppers in the flower supermarket. They have to be good at um, finding those flowers that offer the best nectar and pollen rewards in proportion to the efforts that you might have to put in in order to get these rewards. So in any bee's flight range, there might be two, three dozen different flower species, all differing in nectar and pollen offerings, in the distance to the hive, in the physical efforts that you have to invest to pry the flowers open. and. Uh, and so on. And so we have to be good then at memorizing the advertising that is linked to these rewards, the, uh, the colors, the patterns, the scents, and so on of the flowers to make sure that you then recognize this packaging, the advertising, and, uh, and concentrate your efforts on the most rewarding ones accordingly. Uh, and the way we exploit this behavior in the laboratory um, is that we simply give the bees little rewards whenever they get anything right um, and, um, and hope that they will thus learn what, what's important. So here's an, a simple experiment where we've trained the bee to uh, recognize the, the photo of a, of a human face, a black and white image. You can see a little um, nectar drop here. This is work by uh, Adrian Dyer when he was in my team. Um, and you can then give the bees in a test this face shuffled among um, some other face images, very much like a crime witness test where the, the reward, the indicator of what was previously the correct one is no longer present. There's a spatial shuffling, so you, can't, you have to avoid that the bee learns the location. And indeed, in this particular case, the bee will actually be able to find the correct face. Now, that's just, uh, th th that 
in itself is no indication that the bee recognizes the face as a face. It's just a strange flower. It's a pattern that's associated with, with the reward. And the nice thing about bees, as opposed to many other animals, is that they never be workers, at least they never satiate. Okay, once they're filled up with a reward, they fly home to their hive or nest, um, regurgitate whatever they've collected, and they come right back to a set. So they're very convenient um, animals to work with in that case. Now, the other thing that is special to bees, as opposed at least to many other insects, is that they're central pest foragers. That um, they, um, they have a home to which they must return, and if they don't, they're, they might die, in many cases, depending on which species of bees you are, but more importantly, perhaps, their efforts for the colony are lost, of course, right? So you have to, you cannot tolerate mistakes. You have to be um, very good at um, finding the, the location of your home. You have to also bear in mind the, the vast so many of us perceive bees as honey, social bees, and um, they're of course very prominent, and we, we humans keep them and so on. But there are several, at least 20,000 other species of bees, the vast majority of which are wild and solitary. And these are basically single mothers that construct, construct a nest, and if they were to lose their way on a foraging flight out, it's game over for their, their, their set, resetting their entire fitness to zero. Okay, so there is a strong uh, selection pressure to be a good um, spatial navigator and, uh, and, and capable of, of memorizing the features that indicate the location of your nest very well. So the, the loss in a social species of a single worker is perhaps negligible if she should find, uh, not find her way home, but in its soli solitary bee species, it's uh, a catastrophic uh, result. Now, navigating human environments compared to bee environments is relatively easy. Um, well, at least urban environments. So if you so this, um, have deliberately chosen a picture of a city in Shanghai that many of you might not have visited, but you might have been in a city somewhere where you couldn't read the signs, you um, couldn't easily talk to people for directions, and maybe your phone was out of battery or you didn't have a map. So it is a challenge to find your way around a new environment, but this challenge is made comparatively easy in humans by the fact that these landscapes, these urban landscapes, are, are built from landmarks that are designed to be memorable, that are designed to be unique. So if you're in Paris and you can see the, the Eiffel Tower from anywhere, right? Um, so in most human familiar environments, navigation is facilitated by the fact that you're landmarks are, are recognizable. A natural animal's environment is, is more like this. Um, I don't know if any of you do wild hiking without any sort of electronic aids, or maybe you're off um, um, the, the mobile phone. Right. But, um, but navigating an environment like this without any paths and maps and so on is actually very difficult and have deliberately chosen a, um, a sort of foggy environment because that is quite typical for bees, bumblebees and so on to navigate in such environments. And there's a lot of aliasing, there's a lot of similarity between landmarks. Okay, so your nest might be under this particular tree here. You might have to fly um, to a good map, make a patch that's behind this hill up there, and a good pollen patch might be here. And indeed, there might be multiple such patches that you need to link to even fill your tummy ones. It's not a trivial task, especially not if your brain is the size of a pinhead, but it's not a trivial task, whatever animal you are. Now, the way we now study um, spatial navigation in, in bees is with this equipment called harmonic radar. 
So the B here bears a little transponder. We can't glue anything battery powered on, so not, we can't use transmitters for Bs because they're too, transmitters too big and Bs too small. This is a transponder because what it does is it picks up basically a frequency that's emitted by this bottom dish and transposes it to a different frequency, bounces it back, um, and that's then it picked up from, from the uh, top dish here. And um, we've spent a great deal of time with our collaborators at Rothamsted Research and um, my former postdoc, Joe Woodgate, um, um, invested a lot of time into building or um, supervising the construction of a three-dimensional radar where we could, in addition to uh, tracking the X, Y coordinates, also track height because the ultimate um, dream that we had was to was to not just reconstruct the entirety of a bee's flight path, but also to take the view from the bee's cockpit while she was flying through, um, through a bee's eyes and to see what actual uh, landmarks she might be prioritizing in her search while um, familiarizing herself with an environment. Um, but we, we haven't really been successful. So here's a, a very um, coarse grained track, in this case actually of a of a bee drone um, flying um, around her environment for the first time. The idea, these sort of boomerang shaped things are a bee's eyes. They're very coarse grained in their spatial resolution. At least now bees compensate for that number one by being able to process more information per unit time than we can. In addition, um, they can also make um, Small, more small brain saccadic eye movements to compensate to some extent for their poor, um, relatively poor visual optics. But let's go back to two dimensions because that actually does work, um, the, the full tracking in, in two dimensions. And one challenge that a bee faces in its day-to-day -day life is, life is something very close to um, a traveling salesman problem. Single flowers almost never contain the amount of nectar that's necessary to uh, fill a honey stomach. Flowers want to keep bees going because, of course, they want to uh, be um, their pollen transmitted from male to female flowers or fe from male to female parts. So you have to keep the rewards low to keep them moving. And that means that you often, as a bee, have to visit multiple locations in space to um, to um, fill up a single time. And what you need to do, very much like a, a traveling salesman in that case, is that you have to link the multiple feeding stations, not just in a repeated sequence, but in, one, in a sequence that actually minimizes travel distance, um, time, and energy expenditure. And so here's one not such um, version of uh, the problem. So here's a hive. There are five feeding stations marked in blue, and the bee's task is to find um, a good um, solution to linking these flowers. And this here is not yet a very good path. Green, by the way, is early in the flight. Yellow is in the middle. Red is later. Um, but let's see what a bee does um, over time when she's faced with such a challenge. So we're now in the first flight, bot number is up here. The bee has now discovered two feeding stations. Um, she's now discovered two more, and now the final one. But you can see that there is a great deal of exploration still. She looks um, quite a bit outside the, the area still for alternative feeding stations. But over time, we're now 25 bots. The path becomes more and more streamlined until she's actually now concentrating all her efforts on this, oops, uh, this array and found at least a solution that is very close to optimum. So this area is a bit tricky because there's, of course, a temptation to fly short routes rather than an uh, overall bigger um, uh, optimal route. But they're even with that sort of um, uh, challenge, they are getting pretty close to optimal through sequential iteration of multiple different routes. Now, we were also interested in the question of um, how bees, when left entirely to their own devices, um, there's now no, no, art, no experimental challenge. We're just um, letting bees fly as they want to, how they organize their careers into exploration of the environment around them 
and later exploitation of such food sources. And here's a, a, a video sped up um, about 120, 30 times um, of a bee's maiden flight, the very first flight that she's ever made, um, the first time that she's left her native nest. Blue is the, um, the hive, and you can see that the bee flies in various directions, in loops, um, coming back to near the hive. She doesn't enter it and then flies out in a different direction to um, explore some more. So this entire flight took over two hours, and that's typically or typical of bees exploring their environment. Um, and then the bee returns to the hive. One thing that might be, will become important later is that during one of these exploration loop, the bee um, explores this forest edge up here, but then returns to the hive. By the way, is there a clock somewhere so I can keep an eye on time? Mm. You have 20 minutes left. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. All right, I'll speed up a bit then. I'll, I'll grab my phone so I can. We started late though, right? A bit. <laughs> okay. um, so here's what happens on the second day. The bee does one more exploratory loop in a southwesterly direction. Now she's found something. And then she's dedicating her um, next several days and several dozen foraging buds to just foraging from, this part, from a patch around this particular forest edge and does nothing but, like an assembly line worker, just forages from from this particular patch. Then after a few days of inclement weather when the bee was stuck inside, she flies a few more times out to this forest edge over here. Then a long and outbound flight to this um, um, familiar patch. She appears to change her mind. Unfortunately, we lost her um, along the way there. And then shows up at this forest edge over here at a location that she's only explored once, 10 days at the start of her life. They only live a few weeks, so this is a long period in the life of a bee. Um, and then spends the rest of her days foraging from um, this forest edge over here. And this observation of a kind of mind change, of flying to one destination and then to another one that's only familiar from the distant past is very interesting for us, of course, because it relates to the question of whether there is such a thing as a cognitive map where you can flexibly look up coordinates of familiar destinations. Now, this is not an experiment, and it's only one bee that we're observing here, but the kind of data set that we have here of an entire biography of a bee, of course, is very important to asking whether indeed she can fly novel shortcuts between different destinations, because in many other experiments where people have done, have explored this, you never knew what your animal did before it actually was engaged in the novel shortcutting. Here we know that she's never been on this track before, but we need more data, of course. Now, in my interactions with primate researcher and researchers and corvid bird researchers and other clever animal researchers, they were always a bit dismissive and said, well, okay, yes, they can learn something, we appreciate that, but this learning, spatial learning, learning for is what a bee does on an everyday basis. They have to be good at that because that's their lifestyle. And um, so they said that one approach that they were using is that you deliberately test your animal's flexibility by giving it tasks that no individual in the species history has yet solved. And so here's a bee engaged in a string pulling task, and that is one that's borrowed from bird cognition and so on, um, where we can look at it here again, um, where, um, where the, there is an artificial flower placed under a glass screen and um, you need to um, pull the string to get access to the reward. And that's what our bees are doing here. Here we have two individuals. Uh, one is marked with a red dot and that's one that's already skilled at the task. And it's paired with a naive observer, as we call it, that has, has no experience yet with swing pulling. 
And the experience being told us really, they're now happily setting the nature together. The, uh, the inexperience being just scrounges, and now they're getting a bit um, antsy because they've drunken up the nectar. The experience being going with the red dot now marks, walks over to the next flower, it pulls that one out. This one still um, is trying around at this flower, and now she runs over to the other bee and again capitalizes on that bee's work. And if you do that a good number of times, the inexperienced individual will then be able to, um, by itself, um, pull the screen as well. You can see now again they're drunken up the nectar, and the whole um, procedure repeats itself. And if you do that with, um, with a whole colony, you can then observe the spread of this skill of string pulling, like a social media meme through a human crowd, uh, through an entire bee colony. So what we've done here is that this individual at the top, each dot here is one bee, um, that individual at the top is, um, is the one that mastered the skill first, and whenever a line forms between two dots, between two individuals, that's when there's an interaction while they're, they're pulling strings, and you can see that now there are a number of colored dots, orange dots. And these are all bees that have learned the skill from that individual that was first trained. Okay, when they're colored, that means the bee can now do the trick herself. Now we have a purple dot here. And that's, this is how we mark, with a different color, a second generation learner. A bee that has no longer picked up the skill from that individual that first learned the task but from one that has in turn learned the skill from her. And in this particular colony, the, the skills spread to more individuals even after the originally uh, trained individual died. Okay, so the um, skill continued spreading until everyone in the colony mastered it. And if you do that a sufficient number of times, you can then um, get entire colonies basically cooperating at uh, pulling multiple flowers with, um, with strings. Uh, whether that's actually true, there's true collaboration going on, we don't know that. Again, my former postdoc, Oli Lukola, who did much of this work, is currently looking into that. We're also exploring, uh, this is Chao Wen's uh, work, whether there's some sort of means in comprehension in such string pulling tasks. So here's a challenge where you can see that there's a short string with a flower closer by and a longer string that has to be pulled by the bee to get the actual flower. And spontaneously, after being trained to string pull at all, they're picking the uninterrupted string. On the left, there's another version of the same task where um, there's a diagonal and long string and a perpendicular and interrupted string. This bee is a bit inconsistent in that she um, gives up several times, but she always lands by the correct string. And um, in the end, I think it's she, she, she uh, flies over to, uh, on her third attempt, she finally um, gets it correct. So this is work in progress, but we're quite excited by that. Uh, we need a few more controls, but the, the list of animals that can actually spontaneously solve such a task with interrupted strings is very short. It's primates, end of list. Dogs, cats, and so on, at least without further training, um, will fail at this task initially. Stay tuned. This is not published yet. Now, in another version of this kind of object manipulation task, um, we're, we're asking whether bees can move a detached object, very much like a, a token or a, a coin in a vending machine, to get access to um, the reward. So that the, version, the task here is that the bee has to take a ball and move it to a goal area. And once she's done that, um, she gets, now there's a little automated uh, lid that opens and she gets access to the reward. And again, we wondered whether bees could pick up the skill from a demonstrator, even if they'd never rolled a ball for a reward, and that's shown here. So there's a, a skill bee and an observer bee. And there's three um, balls that, um, that can potentially um, be attended to. And this bee picks the furthest ball and moves it to the center. 
um, and then they both get a reward. Why the furthest ball? So there's a little trick that we introduced here. And the trick is that the bees um, get to learn, the experienced bees get to learn that they cannot actually move the two closer balls because they glue to the surface. So that's what this experienced bee does. She knows I can't move these closer balls, so she always picks, uh, has to choose the, the furthest one to move it to the center. And this is what the, um, the um, observer bee gets to observe three times. And we then put that bee on the spot and ask her, well, if you were to solve the task, which ball would you pick? And of course, she has one possibility of simply aping the demonstrator, of copying the actions that she's seeing the demonstrator perform and pick the furthest ball. Or she um, has the option to pick what is the best solution to reach the desired outcome, ball and center, and pick the closest ball. And that's indeed what she does. You can see she's a bit clumsy with the ball because she has no experience with rolling balls for rewards. But she picks spontaneously, without further training, the closest ball to the target area. So to us, this indicates some form of outcome awareness that the bee uh, appreciates at some level that what the desired end state of the action is, rather than just copying the actions. Now, we already heard that bees are good at recognizing flower patterns. But quite a bit of such recognition could actually be done without there being a kind of mental image of um, a target in the bee's head, but could be achieved by simple feature detectors, edge detectors, color detectors, and so on, that are not actually merged together into a kind of virtual image floating around in the insect's head. And so one way, so just Demonstrating that a bee can recognize patterns or pattern features is not enough to demonstrate that there is a kind of mental representation. But one way of getting at this um, in at least the vertebrate literature is to ask whether there, if there is a representation, then this should be accessible from multiple different sensory modalities. And that's what we've done here. We've, um, well, this is no longer in the press, it uh, was published in 2020. So the, um, the experimental procedure was that we trained bees to get a reward on balls, not cubes, and another group, of course, was trained with the, um, the opposite training. Um, and they did this in a setting where they could see but not touch the, the, the targets. Okay, so these targets are hidden under a plexiglass lid. The bee can land the top, gets a reward, but you can't um, touch these objects. And then we tested the same bees in complete darkness, where they couldn't see the targets, but they could touch them. So and you can see here that this bee is actually hugging a ball rather than a, a cube. And indeed, it turns out that they spontaneously, without further training, spend more times if they've been trained on seeing balls, touching balls in the darkness. And you can do the reverse, of course. You can train the bees in the tactile modality, in complete darkness, um, get them to um, learn that they get rewards on balls, not cubes, or vice versa, and then test them in, um, the, in the lit condition, where, um, where they now can not touch but see the ships. And again, spontaneously, they are, after they've been trained on balls in the dark, spontaneously more attracted to the balls when they can only um, see them but not touch them. So that seems to us to indicate that indeed there is a kind of mental representation that's accessible from multiple different modalities. Now perhaps to the most um, contentious exploration, do insects have emotions? And I encourage all of you to read the, the works of Charles Turner, who was a, a pioneer in animal cognition, and um, especially insects, but also other animals. 
Um, he was African American, as you can see, and for this reason, at the time when he lived over a century ago, found it difficult or impossible to find a tenure post at a major research university. So he spent much of his years um, working as a high school teacher, and from this post, managed to publish over 70 papers, groundbreaking studies in many cases, three of them in the journal Science. And you have to imagine what that means from that sort of um, post. No access to a laboratory or even a library, no PhD students, no funding for experimental equipment and so on. And yet much of his work is, is extremely visionary and experimentally also um, very rigorous. In the case of emotions, um, Turner speculates, and he's aware of that, he has no further exploration, experimental exploration, but, um, but he, um, he's interested in the phenomenon. This is a, a photo from one of his um, papers, so these are two mating wasps, and suggests that one who believes that insects have emotions will find much in the attitude of these amorphous to uh, support his view. Sorry, I forgot he said the coiled antenna, the protruding mouth parts, and the general attitude indicate intense excitement. Now, I, I 20 years ago would have thought the notion of um, insect emotions to be observed. Um, we started to scratch our head a little bit after this experiment where we explored predation threat in and bees' responses to it. In, um, in this kind of setting, one of the things that um, bees have to wor be worried about when they're visiting flowers is not just uh, finding the right rewards, but they're also predation threats. And these crab spiders, like a chameleon, can adopt the color of a flower on which they prey. Um, so here's a yellow one on a yellow flower and a white one on a white flower. We took that situation to the laboratory, to the laboratory with what we call the robotic crab spiders. So these are life-size models of a spider, and there are two sponge-padded pincers that can briefly capture a bee um, and, and, um, and hold it for a few seconds without injuring it and then releasing it um, again. So it's, it's a, a simulation of an unsuccessful predation attempt. And we asked if bees can, um, can learn to get away. And here's... Um, it's a pity that the audio is not working very well. But, um, so here the bee makes a mistake and lands on a, on a, on a spider infested flower. And I'll, I'll, I can mimic the sound. So the bee peacefully through a run. And when she um, got caught, she was like, and then threw away. So they, they clearly didn't like that. And, and perhaps unsurprisingly, um, they, um, they uh, learned from um, this experience and avoided the flowers subsequently when they could. But more remarkably was that their whole demeanor changed, that um, they would, for days after such attacks, scan every flower very carefully um, before deciding to land. But the most um, surprising observation for us was that there were quite a few false alarms where the bee would inspect a perfectly safe flower scan it, and then fly away, as if she'd seen a ghost, basically. So there was an alert to, to the presence of a predator when actually there wasn't one there. And that looked, at least superficially, and I'm um, flippantly anthropomorphizing here, but it looked a bit like uh, something under post-traumatic stress disorder. But how do you study emotions or emotion-like states in animals more formally? So this was just a casual observation in a, an experimental study of aversive learning, but we were then interested in um, exploring more formally whether there are emotion-like states. And so this is a paradigm that's borrowed from um, the, the exploration of emotion-like states in domestic animals. It's essentially asking is your glass half full or half empty? So with the situation of a 50% uh, filled glass, an optimist or an animal in a positive emotion-like state would judge that as, um, as, well, it's half full, everything's good, nothing to worry about, whereas the pessimist would say it's already half empty. Ah. 
Um, it's not, not a good situation. And we, we, um, mim we take that paradigm into the bee's world, and there's a flight arena where either the bee gets a reward when there's a blue target, or no reward when it's green. And there's only ever one stimulus present, and after the bees learn this, what they do is they fly straight to a blue target when, it's, when they know it's rewarding, whereas with the green target, they'll only accept it after a great deal of hesitation. The question then is, what happens with the ambiguous stimulus after the bees have learned this? So we now put a turquoise stimulus in the middle and ask, how do you judge that situation? Now, that's, this is our glass 50% fill. Okay? And unsurprisingly, perhaps, the response is in between um, the response time to blue and green. But crucially, the response to the ambiguous stimulus depends on what happened before the experiment. If the bee was given a little surprise sugar reward droplet before even entering the setup, the response time to the ambiguous stimulus is shorter. So that's our only data slide here. Positive stimulus invariably a short response time, negative stimulus invariably about two minutes. Everything in between depends on what happened before the test. If they got a little sugar reward, that's the red curve, then they accept ambiguous stimulus, stimuli with a shorter delay than um, if they have not had this reward. And Jerry Wright from Oxford University has done the inverse experiment where bees were, before engaged into such a test, were a simulated, exposed to a simulated predator attack. And then the responses shift in the opposite direction. So the ambiguous stimulus is more likely seen as, um, as something uh, negative than it otherwise would. So I, I think I will skip the explorations of bee brains in the interest of time. So um, just to wrap this up, um, I think our studies and other studies do show that there are some sort of representations of space and of things in space that bees can learn by observation and uh, display a form of simple object manipulation or tool use in a manner that indicates uh, international intentionality, a kind of form of an appreciation of the desirable outcome of the actions. They also appear to have relatively flexible access to the memory libraries, an idea of what they want, and explore perhaps at a mental level suitable solutions of getting there. And um, I think these last explorations also show that there are emotion-like states, at least by the same criteria, we're not lowering the bar, um, as they are diagnosed in domestic animals and so on. And these are, I think, key ingredients, at least at a bare bones level, of a mind. And I think all of this um, places on us an obligation to preserve the environments that have shaped these unique minds. You are probably all aware that bees are, in general, in trouble. And I think people are aware that we need to conserve them because we need them to pollinate our crops. But I don't think that their utility is necessarily the only reason to conserve, conserve something. I think the fact that there are most likely, uh, the bees are most likely sentient beings, and so probably other insects is, a, is another good reason to do more for their conservation. All right, um, so I, um, I have this new book out, so I'll shamelessly self, uh, promote that as well. Um, so if you've enjoyed that, you might be interested in the book. I've put some postcards out because there's a code on them, and you get the book 30% cheaper if you use the code. And I will stop here. Thank you very much.